What's good people, um, welcome to 100 Stories Deep, uh, my name is Aaron Gill um, and today we are reading uh, a story called Kien by the Vietnamese writer Nguyen Hui Tip. Um, I'm, I'm sure that I'm mispronouncing that and I've been trying to look online uh, of, of how to pronounce his name and I haven't come across um, any videos where somebody's speaking his name so if you know how to speak his name uh, and you can send me a link or let me know please do because I want to get things like that as accurate as possible um, yeah and the reason why I've chosen the story today is um, is because one I think it's a story with with really great imagery um, uh, it, it speaks about class in Vietnamese 1940 society in, in a really, really, really great way. Um, and um, the author has a really useful way of writing about the ugly, the unspeakable, the inhuman, in almost a magical realism way, using really simple, pure words to sometimes really pain to demonstrate um, how painful how pain and beauty can be so closely related to each other. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, um, here is the story, Kien, by Win, by, let me just try and pronounce that properly again. By Win Hui Tape. So yeah, but this story is written in a sort of meta way, so there's three chapters to the story. Uh, it's quite short. Um, and the first chapter is called The Cause of the Story. <clears throat> Among the people I know, I have a particular respect for the literary scholar K. He understands our literary debates well, which I must confess I don't. There are even times when people compare his articles with whips that lash the horse of creation unerringly along its path. Kay is handsome, intelligent, and especially sensitive to other people's pain and suffering. On many occasions that I've been out with him, I've seen him slip away from places where there are beggars and disabled peoples. In situations where he can't escape, he becomes very agitated. I've seen him turn pale and empty his pockets for a beggar or a disabled person. With me and other young writers of my generation, Kay is very strict. He demands high standards in what he calls the character of a person. Hard work, sacrifice, dedication, sincerity and of course good grammar are the qualities that he requires. Such strictness means our friendship is stormy. However this does not lessen my admiration for him. It has often occurred to me that there must be a very deep reason for Kay's unusual strictness and sensitivity. Then once after I had been inquiring around the point he suddenly let something unexpected slip. My father was Kun, he said. Throughout his short life, his only desire was to become a human being, but he never did. On the basis of that utterance, I wrote this story. Chapter 2 The Story Kun knew that death was about to claim him. His legs were already cold and a deep chill was rising through his body. When it reached the top of his head, he knew it would be the end, his final parting with life. Kun opened his mouth. His thirst was so great he could feel his throat shrivel. He had an enveloping bodily sense that his life was being cornered and crushed. He knew that he could not escape this time. Death was upon him. It stuck out an invisible tongue and black as night slowly licked Kun's eyes closed. More than ten years before, Kun was found in a drain pipe that had been sunk near a stream on the outskirts of the city. The stream was a patch black run off of waste water. It was full of rubbish and supported patches of dust covered water hyacinths. The broken cement drain pipe was laid across a small dirt road so that the wind blew into it from both the stream on one side and the fields on the other. Kun lay in a pipe of stinking rags and was purple with the cold. 
and if you're wondering why he did not die there and then, it was certainly because of Old Ha. Old Ha was a beggar at the market. It is not clear why he was groping around the drain on that day, but as he stood on the road he heard the sound of crying. It seemed to come from under the ground, as though it was welling up from the hell. The old man shuddered. The afternoon was fading into the evening as the last rays of the setting sun illuminated the creamy clouds on the horizon and swept forbidding streaks of wintry light across the face of the earth. The northern wind was howling around the low stalls in the deserted marketplace. This was the right time of the day for demons, and it was the kind of landscape in which ghosts could easily appear. Old Ha lived almost all his life without fearing people who only inspired love or hate in him. What he feared was inhuman. The old man was limp with fear. The wailing was certainly real. He pricked up his ears and listened. It was the sound of a young child crying. Without knowing what he was doing, he ran, stumbling down to the edge of the river. Still gripped by the sound of the crying, he looked towards the road, and there he saw a child lying in the drain pipe. Old Ha came gradually cl- old hat came gradually to his senses when he realized it was not a ghost at all with his soul back in his possession he realized how fortunate he was that the demons had lost an opportunity to snatch it he crawled back up to the drain pipe stuck his hand inside it and pulled out a small child its arms and legs were freezing cold the old man picked up the child in his arms and carried it back to his shelter in the marketplace he called the child Kun, which was the name people often gave to puppy dogs. This was because the child had not really developed into a human being. It was strangely deformed with an enormously hy- hydrocephalic head and soft, seemingly boneless limbs. This meant that it couldn't stand upright, but fell over and lay flat on the ground. However, the extraordinary thing was that Kun had an unusually beautiful face. Kun lived with the old man and did not perish because he possessed two odd powers. One of these was in his eyes, for they aroused fear in everyone around him. If people passed Kun without throwing a coin, without throwing a coin into the torn hat on the ground beside him, they did not feel at ease. The second of Kun's powers was his ability to bear extreme suffering. He could bear hunger and cold with such an indifference that it seemed that his body was made out of some indestructible material. Old Ha took a liking to the child. With Kun, he could more easily take money from be- he- with Kun he could easily make more money from begging, and he carried the child everywhere. At the Fugier festival alone, he made as much as he had made in several years of begging by himself. His way of working was very simple. He would leave Kun lying on his back with his battered hat beside him in the middle of a crowd of people. That was all there was to it. Kun would squirm around and his eyes would do the work. Hey sir, madam, you are human beings. Think of me. Think of some... Sorry. Hey sir, madam, you are human beings. Think of someone like me who is not yet a human. Old Hal would be hiding somewhere nearby, would appear when the hat was full of money, gather it up and leave. Sometimes the old man slipped Kun a few crumbs of corn cake, the way people fed chickens that they are taking to a market. Old Hal regarded Kun as a son. Naturally, he didn't pay much attention to the boy. He was busy. Just as people with other professions were always occupied, beggars had plenty to do. In Old Hat's word, the fate of the boy did not count for much. He never felt uneasy about leaving Kun weak with hunger or shaking with a fever when he went off drinking or gambling. The old man himself had been hungry, as ill, as cold, as that many times. In the world of beggars, people use, child, people use a child for two or three months to attract sympathy. Then, when the child dies, they throw it onto the rubbish heap, as though they are discarding a broken basket. There is no difficulty in finding another one. When you are cold and hungry, you don't care about anything, at least of all ethics and human feelings. As Kun grew up, he gradually became conscious of his fate, 
and this forced him into awareness of the circumstances in which he lived. At the time of this growing awareness there was a war and many people died of starvation. The weather was very cold. Kun and Odha lay rolled up in two gunny sacks on the veranda of a house, a hundred metres from the new market on the outskirts of the city. Old Ha coughed repeatedly. He was very weak and had not been able to get up for a number of days. Occasionally, he coughed up blood. Kun, you've grown up and I'm about to die. You're about to lose me, your main support in life, Old Ha whispered weakly. Actually, I'm not your main support. You and I live together like earthworms, crickets, bees, ants. The old man had a fit of coughing, then cried. Human beings don't live like us. Good heavens, why do they persecute us like this? We only want to live like everyone else, but we are not able to. Kun listened attentively, then turned away and left Olha to sob and wail to himself. He did not say anything. He was already familiar with the situation. He lifted his hand across the torn gunny sack to cover his belly. Kun sighed. He was exhausted. For more than ten years he had been a beggar, and there was nothing he did not know about the life of the downtrodden people. Who are beggars? We are beggars. With torn clothes and no rice we become beggars. He knew how meaningless the lives of people were filled with he knew how meaningless lives of people were filled with misfortune. Sorry, let me just say that again. He knew how the meaningless lives of people were filled with misfortune. They lived like him. Like old ha, like earthworms, crickets, bees, ants. Kun only suffered more because he was disabled. Kun was not a full human being. He found it too difficult to do what everyone else could do. As he got older, Kun saw increasingly that there was nothing easy about standing firmly on the face of the earth. He continued to tremble, continued to take three steps, overbalance and fall on the ground. His arms and legs would not do what he wanted them to do. Around the time of his awareness, Kun had also become anxious for no apparent reason. He didn't understand why he thought or dreamt so much of Jiu, the mistress of the house on whose veranda he and Old Ha lay. Miss Jiu, who sold goods at the market, always gave off the strong scent of cheap perfume, mixed, as country girls often mix it with, a touch of nafalite. She had a pair of small eyes and a very delicate nose with quivering nostrils. She was full of mischievous jokes and laughter. She called Kun the blob with a beautiful face. Hey, blob with a beautiful face, I'll give you a cent. As in money. Come to the door tomorrow morning. You are like the star of change bringing good fortune to this house. When people go to the market and see you, they rush in to do their shopping as though they are ransacking the place. Kun laughed timidly. He bent down to pick up the scent, but fell over on the ground. The coin was three bricks away from his hand. He stood up, held one knee to maintain the centre of his gravity, and reached out with his free hand. Again, however, he fell obliquely to the right. The coin was now a further brick away from Kun. Miss Jiu laughed like a butterfly on, on the veranda of the house. Hey, blob with a beautiful face, you missed by a long way. Try and get up. Try once more and see how you fare. Kun was so pleased and he laughed. Good heavens, he'd made her happy. Kun stood up. He tried to hold both knees. That seemed to work. That's it, that's it. All he had to do was try a little harder, lean over to the left so that he could reach the coin. He gasped and broke into a sweat. Kun estimated the distance and smiled. Then, at the same moment, he leant out to pick up the coin. Ju jumped down and moved the coin one brick to the side. She shrieked with laughter. Kun lost his poise and fell down. He smashed his head on the bricks, and although he was bleeding from the mouth, he ignored his injury. The woman's attractive nose had made him suck in his breath as quickly as she, he could. He had never been as close to Kun as that. Sorry, she had never been as close to Kun as that. Kun laughed heartily. If he had known, he would have sung. Sorry, if he had known how, he would have sung. Old Ha sat quietly in the corner of the broken wall, feeling pity as he looked at Kun. The old man stood up sluggishly, went over to the coin, picked it up and put it in his pocket. Jiu stopped laughing. You miserable old man, 
she snapped as her lips tightened impertinently. That coin wasn't for you at all. I'm sure you'll spend it on drink. Old Hat stood, crestfallen, like someone who had done something wrong and expected a thrashing. Judd disappeared into the house while Old Hat squatted down and wiped blood off Kuhn's mouth. He picked up Kuhn by the armpit and guided him towards the market. Miss Jew had gradually worked her way into Kuhn's life. He thought about her endlessly. He visualised her every move, heard her voice, imagined her laugher, laughter. He paid no attention to old Haz's tear-choked utterances as he lay beside him. Some time later, old Haz vomited. And as he did so, he pinched Kuhn's face so hard with his gnarled fingers that the burning pain suddenly brought Kuhn back to his senses. Kuhn opened his eyes. He was startled to see that old Haz's face had completely changed. It was waxen and distorted, so that the vertical flame flute above the upper lip tilted to one side. From out of the man's mouth there lapped a flow of black blood. He tried incoherently to say something. He tried to press a small purse into Kuhn's hand. Kuhn crawled to his feet. He understood what had happened. Death was appearing before him. It was there. It lurked very deep in the pupils of the old man's eyes and killed the colour in them. Kuhn sobbed. Although he was only very dimly aware of it, he had lost his mainstay, the mainstay of his earthly existence. After Old Has breath, death, Kun's fate did not change radically. He was still hungry and cold. But in the terrible winter of that year, Je married an unfeeling young man, young man who carried merchandise. Kun followed every detail of her life and his observations made him feel that she was not very happy. Kun was not deceived. Three months after the wedding, the husband made off with his new wife's property and fled to the south with a lover. Je had lost everything. She felt ill and was so unhappy that there were times where she contemplated suicide. Nevertheless, her spirits started to lift. The day that her illness seemed to pass and she began to recover, her appetite was a gentle summer day. She sat in her room, looking out onto the street. The sunlight shimmered on the canopies of the shady fig trees, the mango trees and the ornamental shrubs. Nobody else was at home, and all that could be heard was the disconcerting sound of wood borers grinding away in the corner of an empty closet. Miss Jew thought of the market and her small goods shop. She wondered when she would be able to have another shop like that. She looked sadly out into the street, and then suddenly she saw Kyun sitting up on the veranda outside the door of her house. He was feeling for something with his hand in a purse. Miss Jun kneeled down and looked out of the window as Kuhn opened up a cloth envelope that Old Hat had given him. The envelope was made of a dark brown cloth with a black stitching that was as small as a chicken's gizzard. Miss Jun gave a sudden start when she saw some gold rings glittering in the palm of Kuhn's hand. She felt a chill run down through her spine. Her arms and legs shuddered violently and a thought flashed through her mind. Hey, blob with a beautiful face! She hurried, she hurriedly pushed the door ajar and squatted down beside Kyun. What have you got in your hand there? Kyun raised his hand. Kun raised his head, stretched out his hand, and said in a tone of spontaneous pride, Rings. These are the old rings that old hag gave me. Real or fool's gold? Miss Jew inquired as she grabbed Kyun's hand. Let me have a look. She said, now holding three rather, rather heavy rings in her hand, Let me have a look. Miss Jew took each ring and let it fall gently in, onto a slab of stone. She listened carefully. She held the rings up so that they flashed in the sunlight. She put them in her mouth and bit them. Good heavens, it's real gold, she gasped. There's a whole family inheritance here. This blob with a beautiful face is truly rich. She balanced, she blanched, laughed, cried and thumped Kuhn's body repeatedly with her small fist. Real gold is not brass. Don't test it in the flame that burns the golden heart, you little puppy. How is it that I haven't known you until now? Kuhn, whose face had broken into a euphoric smile, swooned with bliss. Come in here, come in here, you rich little puppy, Miss Jew panted, as she closed and clasped her hands beside her. Sorry. As she... Miss Jew panted as she closed the door and pressed Kian's body down into a chair. She put on the rings and then clasped her hands behind her. She stood right, in, right up close in front of Kian's face 
and arched her body like a bow in front of him. Now, I'll bargain, okay? Miss Jia laughed. She spoke with her thoughts, sparking like lightning flash, lightning flashing in her brain. You must, you must first give me the first three rings. It doesn't matter that you don't have them. You are still a beggar. How about it? Do you agree? I'll give you whatever you want. Qian nodded with the corners of his eyes full of tears. He felt only pleasure for he had made her happy. She had recovered. She was strong and Qian was in, in, enraptured. How about it? She cajoled as she bent down and rubbed her forehead against Kyun's. What are you looking like that for? She peeled with laughter. Tell me, tell me, what do you want now? Kyun raised his hand, but only made a vague gesture in a space, because he was unable to activate the sinews in his arms. People who light incense sticks in front of an altar also make gestures like that. All right. I understand now, Miss Jia said. She sat beside Kyun and fondled him. You are also a bastard. You men are all the same. But it's okay. It's all right. That's the price we women must pay. It's okay. I'm only afraid that you can't perform. That an ill-bred husband of mine can't make me pregnant. Mischief pulled Kyun out of the chair and slammed him onto the bed. Kyun was terrified. He screwed his eyes closed and pushed down his face onto Jia's quivering, vaguely blue, translucent nose. He was like someone flying in the clouds. He suddenly felt all the bitterness of his life flow away in a flood of unknown relief. In the end, Kyun had forgotten about the time that she, he had spent sitting on the street. That means we're all square! He could hear the sound of Miss Jia's voice somewhere. He understood that he had just experienced something really wonderful. He felt empty but had a sense of surpassing exhalation that dizzied and dazzled him. Kyun did not comprehend that this was the only opportunity he would have in his miserable life to experience such a feeling. But this opportunity, in all its strangeness, would give Kyun a son in nine months' time. Nine months later, Mrs. Kyun gave birth, sorry, Miss Jia gave birth to a son. Some months before, she, she had said to Kyun, Hey, blob with a beautiful face! You were about to have a child. I couldn't have believed anything as strange as this would have happened either. Kim was so happy he was beside himself. He didn't eat or drink, and all that was left of him was skin and bones. He could have not believe he was going to have a child. Someone who was not yet a human being could still have a child. Kim visualised it very clearly. It would move strongly across the face of the earth. It would never lose its balance. It would smile as it went through life. It would wear a halo shining with as many colours. Kun lived in an agitated state during the last months of Miss Jia's pregnancy. He became seriously ill. His greatest fear was that death would strike him before he knew what the child was like. He prayed daily for death's forbearance. And his prayers were answered. Death would wait until the minute his son was born so that he could, so that he could take his place on earth. On the day that Miss Jia gave birth, Kun crawled from his stall in the market to the window of her house. It was drizzling, and for the penetrating cold numbed bod and the penetrating cold numbed Kun's body. His head was burning. From time to time, he passed out. Only a little over a hundred meters was a great distance for Kun. Every meter, he dragged himself along the road. He struggled with death. He was there, as black as the night falling around him. Kun continued to edge himself along meter by meter as it pulled him back down into the mud while he dragged himself along blood oozing out of his ear he groaned he reached the veranda outside the lamplight in the window and fainted when he regained consciousness Kun felt Kun felt as though some immense object was pressing on his body Kun opened his mouth thirst his throat felt dry in all his weary life as a beggar, he had never been as thirsty as this. He had tried to hold his breath to regain his strength. Alternatively, he passed out and regained consciousness, while he waited for a sign that his child was born. Then, in the middle of the night, Kyun was suddenly startled for the sound of a trembling cry inside the house. It was the sound of a wailing newborn baby boy. Kyun knew that his child was born. Kyun smiled blissfully and sank into the unconscious. A very light wisp of wind glided over Kun's still face. 
Kion was dead. It had been a really short. It had been really short. This life of someone who was not yet a human being. It was the winter of the Great Famine of 1944. Chapter three, conclusion. After I'd finished writing Kion's story, I took it and read it to the literary critic K. He turned pale as the fate as the story unfolded. That is not correct, he said, pulling the manuscript out of my hand. You have fabricated the story. You need to get it straight. The reality was very different. How could you know what my father was like? Kay searched somewhere in the bookcase and found a pile of photographs. He flicked through the portraits for a moment and then pulled out a colour photo. He gave a gentle laugh that built up and faded away, while his soft hand touched the pressure point behind my elbow. My father was Kim, but he wasn't like that. Do you see this? This is my father's photo right here. The photo was of a big fat man wearing a black silk shirt with a starched collar. He also wore a neatly trimmed moustache and was smiling at me. So thank you for listening to the story. Um, so yeah what I want to ask of you maybe so as I mentioned in the intro the stories um, it, it it puts the two extremes of the unspeakable and the beautiful so close together that sometimes you it's hard to see which one's which uh, and it made me think of all the contradictions that I see um, when I'm about so for example like walking past um, a large bank and a homeless person sitting outside of it. Um, I just, and yeah, life is full of contradictions. So maybe I just want you when you're, when you're out and about in life, um, just to be really aware of the contradictions in society and ask yourself what, what has happened to cause this inequality. Um, I'll give you a hint. Um, colonialism, neocolonialism, capitalism, imperialism, class warfare, and lots of other things. But um, yeah, just just take in the contradictions around you, and you can really start to realise like how absolutely contradictory our society is. Um, yeah, thank you for listening to the story. Um, there's lots more in the Hundred Deep Stories you can listen to on our YouTube channel by following our socials and by hitting the subscribe button below. All right.